The chapter goes on past verse 26, if you can obviously see that there are more verses there, but we won't be going through those um, in our study this time in this proverb. But this evening we will look at these next few verses and consider what's being said. <clears throat> so if, you've lost, if you didn't, if you close your Bible up and open it back up there to Proverbs chapter 3. In these next verses, Solomon personifies wisdom and the benefits of having it. Proverbs uses personification pretty frequently, um, and it makes it in a way sometimes it's easier to understand things. Sometimes it's, uh, it gives a, it's like an illustration. It's just something else we can use as a, maybe a memory peg or uh, something to call to, uh, to our attention. But we see wisdom is personified. You'll see that, like I said, very frequently in the book of Proverbs, how some point is being made. Um, Proverbs is, is a woman here, but also, or Proverbs, wisdom is a woman here. Um, I'm going to lose track of my thoughts if I make a mistake. <laughs> so uh, wisdom is personified as a woman, but you'll go through it as well, and you'll see that um, wickedness is also personified as a, as a woman, a lot of times as an adulterous woman. Um, I'm thinking of Proverb, uh, Proverbs chapter 9 specifically. So we see the use of personification. It happens frequently. Giving does everybody understand what personification is? It's basically giving physical, personal, mostly human attributes to things that aren't human. <laughs> uh, obviously, wisdom not being a person. But so wisdom is the key focus in these set of verses here. And we're going to see several things. We're going to see um, how blessed we are. We are blessed, as I phrased it in the first section of verses here. How we're blessed this much. Then how the Lord uses wisdom and how we are to keep wisdom finally in the last set of verses that we'll look at in this section. But again, the key to this passage that Solomon is trying to get, give out to his son, because recall, um, he uses that phrase in verse 11, my son. But he also began it in chapter, or in verse 1 of chapter 3 here. So this king, this man that we're all familiar with, who was a wise man, and we'll talk about that a little bit more too, um, decided that he was going to raise his children in wisdom, make sure they get, got these things. As we talked about last week, this for those of us who have kids right now, so basically my family and the Niedergall family, we, we are doing our best to practice this, to teach our kids wisdom so that when they grow older, that will be with them, it will be where they can not just fall back on, but their foundation so that every decision that they make They'll have come across it in a wise way. But as, as well, for, for those of us who have grown kids, um, we can still teach and, and impart wisdom into them, though that they now, as grown adults, maybe with their own kids, uh, they have to make their own decisions. But as a parent, to some degree, you still have that responsibility there to teach in that way. So we can relate in that way. As, as, as Solomon the father did with his son, but even even beyond that, going even further, every individual, every Christian who is um, uh, supposed to be a wise person, they can impart these principles of wisdom even to those around them. They can uh, especially think of um, how frequently Paul, the Apostle Paul, uses, uh, he, he speaks of those people that he's led to the Lord as his children, Timothy, for instance, as his child in the faith, um, as you talk with someone about the Lord, and maybe they get saved, you have that opportunity to bring them along as, if you would, a spiritual child in the faith. Um, so there's, really, this encompasses everyone. You, have, you are to live in wisdom, but also you are to teach, even in every aspect of your life, in, in, in a wise way. So that's, that's about the most general I can make that statement. So first we see here in verses 13 through 18, it'll be our largest passage or section of verses we'll look at. We see um, how blessed we are. We were blessed this much. Starting in verse 13, it says this. Happy is the man, or blessed. That's why I keep saying the word blessed. That word happy can be translated as blessed too. So happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. So we see at the very first of this section here that 
blessing and happiness follow the individual that goes after wisdom. And ultimately, um, happiness and blessedness, we, we and, and whether it's just the nature of, human, of, of being human or uh, a misunderstanding or whatever the case, a lot of times we interpret happiness as never going through any struggles and, and always having everything that we need right when we need it. And just always living in a, if you would, a, a, a very prosperous life. It's one of the negative aspects of like the prosperity gospel, the, the health and wealth teachings that come that if, if you are wise, then you're always blessed financially and, and, and material, materially. And that's not at all what scripture teaches. But our, our hope and our blessing and our happiness as a believer is based in just in God. That way when trials do come, we're not going to say, well, I must not be blessed. I must not have the ability to be happy because I'm facing this difficulty financially, materially, or whatever the case. But no, it's established in the Lord. And obviously we, we kind of see this teaching throughout. So we see at the very first that blessings and happiness follow the individual that goes after wisdom. And Solomon is probably, like I said at the beginning here, Illustrating in this way so that his son is able to understand. Illustrations help um, help at times when difficult things are being said. So he sets the stage here as wisdom being the focus, blessing coming for those who seek it. But we find out something else here. So he says, uh, I keep on wanting to go back to verse 1. Happy is the man that findeth wisdom and the man that getteth understanding. We have some action that's involved here. He finds these things and he... Um, gains or he gets understanding or the believer. So obviously work is implied in this. There's, there's work implied to finding and to gaining wisdom. It doesn't just, when you are saved, the Lord doesn't just impart you with all wisdom and understanding and then you go forth. But no, you spend time in God's word and you, and you, you gain in that knowledge so that you understand who he is better. You understand what your job is as a believer better and you carry out those things. As, as is that you're responsible for. And again, I don't think anybody has any struggle with that. Anyone that's ever worked in a job of any sort, I mean, we can say at a workplace, or whether you're working at uh, something at the house, at home, if you're, if you're doing anything, it took work and effort in understand how you can do this, but if you're gonna make, a, if you're gonna make something, pasta. I, make, I like to make homemade pasta. I found out last time that I made pasta, that um, I can add too much oil to it and it doesn't roll out at all. It just kind of flips around on my little pasta roller and uh, gets me frustrated. <laughs> but there's effort that's, you know, that, that I had to, okay, I gotta figure out why that happened, I learned here. But just saying all that, and it, whether you're making pasta or you're out working in an electrical company or if you're, you know, doing this, that, and the other, you put your own, uh, you have your own work experiences to relate to in that. It took effort to, to gain. Uh, understanding in the, in the job that's set before you. So we see that um, effort is involved. So gaining wisdom takes effort, but it is always worth the effort that's put forth into it. Again, because we're not just talking about random knowledge. It's, it's wisdom. Once you gain wisdom and you, and you get a taste for that, if you would, and you start pursuing wisdom, it always is, is something that is worth the effort that's put into it. It always, wisdom is, um, its return is always greater than what is put forth into it. It always is better at the end. Verse 14, we see, 14 and 15 specifically, we see a financial example that Solomon's using here. We're talking about wisdom and we're talking about finances or, or not talking about finances specifically, but money. And here we are. It comes from the man who has it's been, he's been called the wisest man that's ever lived and possibly the most rich that's ever lived. We've got, who is it? The last I've checked, Elon Musk, he has been the, he is the current wealthiest person in the world. I think he's in the, he, last I checked, he's in the $200 billion range. And I think he doubled that. He, the guy who was uh, racing him, if you call it even a race, uh, Amazon. And they were kind of neck and neck at a hundred billion. All of a sudden, Elon Musk has doubled that. I mean, can, can you imagine that? But, uh, I'd like to find out maybe when we get to heaven how much exactly did Solomon have? He, he never struggled financially. He had a, a, an, an immense amount of wealth. 
but we're, we're having these instructions coming from the man who has a lot of wisdom and, and had a lot of money. Okay, verse 14. For the merchandise, and the, again, we're talking about wisdom here, personifying it. For the merchandise of it, of wisdom, is better than the merchandise of silver, and the, and the gain thereof than fine gold. So here it is, Solomon's coming out. He can speak from experience here to say these things about silver and gold, and ultimately he'll talk about jewels um, uh, or rubies in, in verse 15. How is it that the profit or the merchandise are better than silver and gold could be? I mean, I've got silver and gold in my hand, and I look at that, and I, and I put wisdom over here, and it's just ethereal. It doesn't have a, a physicalness to it. I'm thinking, oh, there's a whole lot of value sitting here in my hand, I, especially if you use gold today. If you had gold bullion in your hand, and it's you could feel it in your hand, that could be a lot of money. That's worth it. It's, it's a lot of money per ounce. So how is it that this statement is made here, that it's the merchandise thereof is, is of, of wisdom is better than this, that of silver and, and better than fine gold? Because silver and gold do not produce anything, really. No, no, you could go and say, well, if I, I put my silver and gold in the stock market when it's doing well, then it starts to produce a little bit more. But the thing is, you don't just... If you picture it, just throw money there at the stock market, and all of a sudden it ha happens because you can start throwing money at, at that or whatever thing you're investing in, and just randomly, and you just tank and lose absolutely everything. But what did it take in order for using even that physical substance to be worth something to go more? It took wisdom to know what to invest in. So you see here where Solomon is, is getting really to the core of it. Wisdom is what causes those things to be worth what they're worth and to gain from them. So silver and gold don't produce anything, and at times they're even, they're even volatile. But wisdom is infinite. It's infinitely exchangeable, I should say, and productive. When you use wisdom in your life, when you are living out wisely, well, like I said, it will always have a better return. It will always benefit you in, in every way. And uh, as long as we have that mindset of what true benefit is, there is an eternal aspect to it, and there is um, uh, the, what we should be valuing spiritually and as a believer. Um, we see a great deal of, of, of um, productivity, I guess, if you would. Verse 15 here, going on, it says, She is more precious than rubies, and all the things thou canst desire are not to be compared unto her. So he continues this thought here of... Um, the value of, of wisdom. So the money's example continues here. Solomon understood silver and gold and jewels. And because it is said he was the richest man ever to live. I've kind of already said that. But we, we see it. He's, he, is, he had... It's, it's, I talked with Dana about it um, this afternoon. It's Second Chronicles 9, is that right? Second Chronicles 9 gives the account of this queen, Queen Sh uh, Sheba that came to Solomon, and when she came to him, she brought silver and gold and, and, and the finest riches to give to him. And do you know why she was doing that? Because of his wisdom. Because everyone knew this man was immensely wise, and he was able to help. Obviously, I don't know if it's specific of her circumstances. Maybe she needed some advice, and she was willing to pay top dollar for that. But not only did he gain in those riches, but we also see that uh, it was because of the wisdom that he had. So none of these, none of these things—these gold, gold, silver, rubies, diamonds, or anything—can be compared to the value of wisdom. Just think, wisdom is what purchases gold, silver, and jewels anyway. So the pursuit of wealth is in stark contrast here with the pursuit of wisdom. Solomon, Solomon, I think, is setting that out here for his son. Here he is, this child growing up with a father who is the king of this nation, um, who is extremely wise, but he also has more money than you can imagine. Uh, he never wanted none of Solomon's children, though he had many, he had many wives and concubines, but none of them, even with all that, none of them struggled for need. And, and, and at, at times that can be a problem. I, I, you hear stories about Individuals who have made families, husbands or wives who've made lots of money, and then they raise children, and then their children are almost worth nothing and no good because they've always just had everything. 
and never had struggled. But Solomon, I think, is trying to teach his son here the value of wisdom. And if you have that, you'll have other things that you need. Verse 16. Verse 16 through 18, actually, we see the, the true gain is what I've titled this little part. What true gain is. It says, length of days is in her right hand, and in her left hand riches and honor. So here Solomon confirms what he had said earlier on, um, on the teachings of life expectancy and of those pursuits and wisdom. If you look at um, verse 2, it says, he starts in verse 1, My son, forget not uh, my law, but let thine heart keep my commandment. And obviously he's speaking from, from wisdom that the Lord had given him. And he says here the benefit, remember we talked about, that's something I didn't mention to begin with, but we had last week we had the benefits and then the uh, the uh, or the exhortation and the benefit following what the Solomon has said. That's not what's going on here. We don't have that set up. But he does on a few occasions in this set of verses refer, refer back to something that's mentioned. So again in verse 16, length of days is in her right hand and in her left hand riches and honor. To go back to verse 2, it says for length of days and life, long life and peace shall they add unto thee. And that's Solomon's commandment, but wisdom ultimately adds these things. Wisdom prevents you from dangerous and even irresponsible decisions. One does not act um, uh, act out in a rash manner when they're being controlled by wisdom. When wisdom guides the footsteps, they won't make a, a, a quick decision based off of whatever emotion or just not thinking. Um, even though quick decisions may be required, it will be filtered through, through wisdom. So the wisdom will prevent those things. And ultimately, if, if you're doing that, if you're not acting rashly all the time and putting yourself in bad positions all the time, um, your days are probably going to be a little bit longer. <laughs> now, obviously, that's not talking about the wiser you are, the less you're going to fight off physical ailments and things like that. That's not the case at all. But you may know how to treat them better. Who knows? <laughs> Verse 17. It says this. Here... Her ways are ways of pleasantness or kindness, and all her paths are peace. So here are some guarantees that are being set forth here. If you walk in wisdom, if you live there, we, we have that length of days that she has the ability to give out, if you would. But also her ways are ways of kindness, and her ways are ways of pleasantness. The Lord was not saying these things flippantly. This is the truth. We, we, can, we can take this as absolute truth. There's pleasantness and, and um, peace when we look and live in wisdom. And if you recall, again, last week we have that similar phraseology or topic of what it's talked about in, in the previous section here. Uh, let me see if I can find it real quick. I'm kind of jumping off, off note. That's fine. Well, I don't have it marked out. I'll, Go back and read in there. You'll, you'll find out where it talks about here. Verse 3. Let not mercy and truth forsake thee. Remember I said that true loving kindness. Bind them about thy neck and write them upon the table of thy heart. And then it goes on to say in verse 4. So shalt thou find favor and good understanding in the sight of, of, of God and man. And, and there is peace involved in that as well. So here Solomon's kind of reiterating his point here. The benefits of wisdom. It is always beneficial. Verse 18. Uh, this section here of blessing and happiness is closed off. It says, She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and, her, and happy is everyone that retaineth her. So what is he saying here? The tree of life. I mean, our minds probably are going back to the Garden of Eden and this tree that Adam and Eve are uh, 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 connected to, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Um, the tree of life is mentioned in a, a Excuse me, the tree of life and the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but the tree of life is what they uh, ate off of. Um, we see kind of a an analogy towards, or I think analogy would be the right word here. Um, what's being said here is there's a continual giving of its fruit. So wisdom is like that tree of life, and it continually gives and provides. It provides kindness, it provides gain and peace and safety and security. Um, amongst uh, between you and God and, and man and your own mind. But here as Solomon personifies this and just shows the great blessings of being connected to wisdom, he connects it with here, that tree of life. He says, she is a tree of life to them that hold, lay hold on her 
and happy is every man that retaineth her. So again, there's those actions of um, holding on, staying in wisdom, not just like, okay, I got a little bit of wisdom when I was in college, and now I can just kind of go off and coast. Or I got a little bit of wisdom at this point in my life, and now I'm set to go. But no, it's a, it's a laying hold and a constantly being with and a retaining of this, making sure you, you're, you're staying up on your wisdom in the Lord. You're being in the Word of God is the primary way to do that. So once you pursue wisdom, you're able to see the path to continue in it as well. And, you, and that desire keeps increasing. I'm retaining her. So again, as you laid a, hold, laid a hold there, laid hold upon her there, and happy is every man who that retaineth her. Again, we see that continuous action of trying to gain wisdom. So quick application here. Wisdom is not easy to get. It's not, it's not always something that, like I said, you don't get the word, you don't get infused with it at salvation. It takes effort and takes it, it's, there's, there's a required effort that's involved there, and it can be difficult. But it is never impossible to gain. God is never going to put you in a position where you're, you need the wisdom, but you're just not going to get it because he's holding it back. That's not the case at all for the believer. Also, you must put forth the effort, as we've seen two, two separate times here. But the reward is always attainable. It's always there. You can gain wisdom when it's necessary. And when you pursue it, you put the effort there and there, it is rewarded. These rewards that are even mentioned are attainable. How much effort are you putting forth, though, is the question. Are you trying to gain wisdom so that you may live a life that's glorifying to God? And that's, that's uh, a testimony to the world around you that may open up a door of evangelism for yourself. How much effort are you putting into gaining wisdom? Look at your current life. Examine yourself and look at the choices you've made and some of the uh, consequences, good or bad, that you're living in. Can, you, can more be checked off in the, this is a consequence of good, or can more be checked off into, this is a consequence of not acting wisely? Verses 19 and 20, we see the Lord's use of wisdom here. What greater example could we have? The Lord was not here dependent upon wisdom, but it is a, a central focus, if you would, uh, in his creative acts as he uh, talks about creation here. Verse 19 says this, The Lord by wisdom hath founded the earth. By understanding hath he established the heavens. So wisdom and understanding uh, or how God created. The Lord's use of these are not to be, uh, are, are to be an encouragement to us. Here, this, if the Lord used wisdom, if the Lord, um, and again, it's not because he's subjected to those things and he has to have a tool that's greater than him or he is unable to do something because he doesn't have this particular tool. It has nothing to do with that. It just shows his power over those things, but his connection to it. Um, true wisdom, as we found out last week, um, comes from fearing the Lord. Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7, Proverbs 9, verse 10 are very um, specific verses that say that. But if you're walking and living in wisdom, there is a connection that you're going to have there with the Lord in that. In light of, like I said, true wisdom, which comes by fearing the Lord, which means that there's salvation involved. <clears throat> so they're connected to the Lord there. To go against wisdom and understanding is to go against the very underpinnings of of the creation. Solomon could be saying that. This is what God used. Why would you not take advantage of this, son? Why would you not take advantage of this? Verse 20. Uh, it continues the discussion here of his use of them in creation. It says, By his knowledge the depths are broken up and the clouds drop down the dew. So here's a remembrance of Genesis chapter 6, the flood that came about. The destructive nature of the flood is seen there at the very beginning of the verse. It says, by his knowledge, the depths are broken up. If you, if you go back and read the account of the flood, it'll talk about how the deep was opened up. And from what, I, from what I've studied, and, and you can hear from, uh, I think, the majority of creationists, those who are believers who are scientists that deal with these things, they talk about that, the water that was under. So we had the water, the firmament that was above that we do not have any longer, that rained down. But we also had the deep that broke forth and the waters that were under the under the earth that came forth and caused this 
this tremendous universal flood that flooded the world. Um, and so here Solomon is saying, saying in that, the Lord in his wisdom used that to break forth those things. Um, maybe this was something he talked with his son about. Maybe his son had questions about Noah and the flood. Who knows? That's another question that we can ask Solomon when we get to heaven. <clears throat> but he uses this example, maybe a real picture in, this, in the mind of this individual. And obviously, yes, we... I'm a big proponent of when we need illustrations, we need to first look um, in Scripture and find whatever is in there. And then you go, go to the whole counsel of God's Word. If we need to talk about grace, and this passage maybe is talking about grace, but I need a little bit more, go find more references in Scripture to talk about it. But on occasion, we can go to you know illustrations outside of that. But I, um, I see here his use here of this, I think, in that way. So, And then finally, at the end of that verse, it says... Uh, at verse 21, no, verse 20, sorry. Um, and the clouds drop down dew, uh, drop down the dew here. So here, wisdom was used when we see the turmoil of the creation flood, but also it, um, as the Lord brought dew and as the dew comes down, it's just an example of the nourishment that wisdom provides. The Lord wielded these in creation his, uh, and his created power. His created power extended over these fundamental principles. We can praise the Lord for that. When you pursue wisdom and understanding, you're really pursuing the Lord. And again, I think we're all wise enough to use the word what we're using to know that, you know, we don't go, I mean, there is a lot of information. Information and wisdom are not the same thing. But there's a, it's involved there. <laughs> if you're being wise, you gain information, but Obviously, we don't go out to different branches of religious belief to go find some wisdom on how to live properly. The thing is, is if you really look at all these false religions, I, have, I won't say absolutely, make like a blanket statement, but most of these things are going to refer back to something that God has established in his word. They'll, they'll bring up this, you know, treat one another like you want to be treated. Well, the Lord said that very clearly on the Sermon on the Mount called the Golden Rule. And, and so forth. But you can see, if you look at other religious beliefs, that they actually draw from Scripture. Whether they know that directly or not, I don't know. But. So, uh, pursuing wisdom and understanding, you are pursuing God. But that wisdom is based here in the Word of God and Him. Don't ever think, also on this, don't ever think you've, you've, you've attained it. You, you, you're, I'm at a point where I just don't really need any more. I'm, I'm good. i got enough wisdom to live my life right. No, it's a... It's, Wisdom itself, being a wise person, is going to drive you to think, I, I, I don't know enough about my Lord. I need to spend more time with him. I don't, you know, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I barely know anything. That's one thing that I can say, and I've heard it said by some new with me, but the, the more I've spent in God's word studying it in an academic manner, there are times that I feel like, man, I just don't know a thing. <laughs> uh, I just, I need to spend more time in the word of God. And I think that's just the word of God doing its work. Of saying, just keep keep drawing forth there. Okay, verses 21 through 25, we have Solomon's encouragement to his son to keep wisdom. Solomon's, Solomon encouraged his son to keep these things as they will only bring benefit, and confidence, and peace here. Verse 21 says, My son, let not them depart from thine eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion. So don't let them vanish away. Keep them... Before your eyes, that constant um, view of these things. You allow, when that happens, you, when you allow this to happen, wisdom does not try to run away. It doesn't try to elude those who pursue it. It's there for the, for the picking, like that tree of life. It's there to just pick it and enjoy it. Keeping it before the eyes has the idea of, of always right there in front of you, but not being in the back of the mind. I like wisely when it really counts. Uh, it, you know, it's there. I've got it stored back in the back of my mind, but I'm just living how I see fit right now without, um, in, in, a, in a rash way, for instance. As he says uh, at the end of here, keep sound wisdom and discretion. Discretion, so we're keeping wisdom on the forefront of our mind, but discretion, it describes prudence. And prudence implies a planning, planning ahead, being prudent. Not being rash. So wisdom would have you plan things out and not act in a way that's unthought out. Verse 22 says, 
so shall they be life unto thy soul and grace to thy neck. Does that sound familiar? Again, we see the, uh, the point of verse 3 here. Verse 3, let not mercy and truth forsake thee, or we talked about loving, uh, true loyalty forsake thee. Bind them about thy neck, write them upon the tablet of thy heart. And again, verse 22, so shall they be life unto thy soul, the heart-soul connection there, and grace to thy neck. So your soul here is who you are. And as wisdom is, is there connected that with the heart and soul, it is where you determine all of your decisions, how you make the decision. I'm going to act forth in this way, but I'm thinking about it. Wisdom is giving me direction here. And like I said about the neck kind of representing outwardly. You're outwardly, if you're acting wisely, then people around you are going to recognize that. I don't think Solomon, when... The Queen of Sheba came. It wasn't because he had billboards lined up down to her, her palace saying, Come see King Solomon, the wisest man that's ever lived. Nothing like that. It was just his, it was his testimony. This, this guy knows the Lord, and, and he knows uh, he's a wise individual. And I just thought came into my head. He did a lot of dumb things, too, to be so wise. <laughs> but apparently uh, people were able, over, able to overlook those things. But he was wise, a wise man. <clears throat> Verse 23. Uh, then shalt thou walk in thy way safely, and thy foot shall not stumble here. So, <clears throat> because wisdom and prudence are what makes the man here, there is a security in the day, the day, the day. Then shalt thou walk in thy way safely. If you have, if you have been prudent, and you have sound wisdom, as Solomon has encouraged in verse 21, then when you walk, um, it will be a safe way. Finding my place here. Verse uh, 24 goes on to say, um, When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet here. So here in the day-to-day -day where, you're, where, where you're aware and you're, you're looking, you're able to see things, you're making decisions, um, you have a little bit of ability to, to keep yourself out of a bad situation. We go down here to, to the referring to the most vulnerable point of a person in a day. is when they're asleep, when they're laying down. They're, some of us, a little bit more unconscious than other people when we sleep. But when you're just at the most vulnerable, it even protects here. So how is that? I'll read that verse one more, one more time. When the lie down, thou shalt be... Uh, thou shalt not be afraid, yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet here. So at the most vulnerable, when you act wisely, you know you're at the Lord's mercy, and that is a secure place. When you're acting wisely, and then you can lay down in comfort. There's those unfounded fears that really at times only take a, a wisdom to help drive away. They're not there. You lay down, your, your head's not constantly worrying about everything that, that could possibly go wrong in the, in the middle of the night. But you lay down and, and, and you're at rest because you're at peace, because wisdom is guiding you. Um, and not only that, but it is a, is, is a sleep that is sweet, not tossing and turning. I mean, I, I, I imagine all of us can say there's been times when we've gone to bed we've gone to bed with a heavy heart and there's something on our mind that we're really fighting and maybe we're not fighting well at it. And then even when we sleep and we wake up in the morning, we can recall dreams that we've had because, because of those things. But walking in wisdom and, and having these things bound to you, as Solomon said, it can prevent even those things. It gives you the peace and the sleep that you need. Verse 25, be not afraid of sudden fear, neither of the, the desolation of the wicked when it cometh. So fear and the tribulation of the world will come. It says that very clearly. Of the wicked, so the very part here, these, this sudden fear and desolation of the wicked when it cometh. And there's not a denying of that. Again, like I talked about, a lot of times with this prosperity mentality gospel it's you know you're never going to struggle you're never going to suffer you know it always causes everybody who buys into that to be wondering why in the world they're the only ones that's not struggling with fear and tribulation that comes 
But the reality, these things come. So knowing that they come, how are you able to deal with them? Again, our, our minds, when tribulation and persecution and, and sufferings come for the Christian, our minds go to the Lord and we realize that he is in control and he takes care of our problems and we are settled a little bit more. So Solomon tells his son, be not afraid, though, of sudden fear, neither of desolation of the wicked when it comes. So wisdom doesn't prevent wicked actions from, a, from happening and wickedness from attacking, but it gives you confidence when it comes. Sudden fear does not confuse the person who has chosen to be established uh, in wisdom. I can think of things where you may be uh, driven by a sudden moment of fear. Uh, driving down the road and you see a car veer off into your lane, there's a, you know, that taste of adrenaline that you get in your mouth and that fear, of, oh, what's going to happen? And, you know, hopefully in, in some form of wisdom, you veer over a little bit or do what you need to do to stop that instead of acting out irrationally. And that's, that can play out in different ways, obviously. But um, that's just one example of maybe a potential sudden fear. Are you establishing yourself in wisdom? Wisdom first comes by fearing the Lord. When this is set, you can gain knowledge. When you fear the Lord, then you can start to gain knowledge and understanding. Let, the, let your knowledge be uh, controlled by the fear of the Lord. And we finally, we conclude in verse 26. It says this, For the Lord shall be thy confidence, and shall keep thy foot from being taken. All that has been said thus far is established by the wisdom that is stated in these verses. And again, verse 26, For the Lord shall not or shall be thy confidence and shall keep thy foot from being taken. Only the Lord can bring, bring true unchanging confidence, unchallenged confidence. If you fear the Lord, if you're acting in, the, in true wisdom, then um, you can truly have confidence. When the Lord is recognized, one will know um, he represents absolute truth. If you have the Lord, then you will not get your foot caught here. When you're, when you're trusting in the Lord and you know, you know, I know this and I know this and I know this about God, how he's worked, what he's done, what he's promised, what he's going to do. And these things, you know, that's wisdom, knowing those things. And whatever comes up, those are what direct you. Again, just examples of wise things. Those would help you. Those are the things that help you when, again, we get on, we, we look at how the world is working politically and world governments and how things are, uh, you know, especially in this day and age, we see some difficult things that happen. We, we, there, are, there are individuals who look at this and say, this, this is mimicking a lot of things that happened during some major crises that happened in history. But as, as a believer, Again, we don't look at that and say, yeah, well, I'm not going to actually suffer during that time with anything that comes about. No, we look at that and say, difficult times may be coming, but you know what? My God is still in control. That's, that's a wise thing to be able to say that and take confidence in that. And then even in the moment when the difficulties come and we fear, even when we know about the Lord, we remind ourselves, yeah, but God's in control and he gives the peace. He gives us peace so that we can walk safely in the day and even lay our head down at night and have confidence. So I ask these last questions here as we close. How wise are you? Some of that can be recognized by people around you. We can recognize someone who's wise to some degree or someone who's foolish. But only you can really answer that question for yourself, ultimately. Are you acting wisely? You do that by spending time in his word. Your wisdom is only limited when you stray from God. It's a choice. God says it's right there, right for the picking. You take it, but it's up to you to do that. Finally, always seek the Lord. When you do that, you will find wisdom. And any, any question that you may have, any, any time where you need to know specifically about something that you need to do, seek the Lord first and primarily, and he will give you direction and understanding. Or he'll, he'll, if anything, he will give you peace about moving forward in the darkness that he's going to walk you through. That darkness may not be bad, but just you're going to be limited on what's going on. You just need to step forward, and I will give you the direction as time comes. But God never holds back wisdom to those who ask. James talks about that, too. Never think about that to us right now. All right. 
Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for your word. Thank you that we have, again, this book of Proverbs that's just so simply laid out. It's so simply laid out that we can read this and then, you know, read this challenge or whatever and get an answer directly or a benefit or an encouragement. We're grateful for books like that, that we can go through our lives knowing that uh, you give us all that we need to know in order to live the life that would honor you. I pray that we would do that this week, that our hearts and our minds be set on you, that we would walk in a way that would bring glory to your name, that it would be a light to the darkness that is out there that we live in. And that we do all, as we do all these things, that we would bring you glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. We